The movie starts with several news channels reporting about a deadly virus named the Saharan Flu. The flu, which has a 100% fatality rate, has decimated the Earth, and it is believed that almost 3 billion people have passed away. Now, with the human population dwindling at a rapid rate, the United States government has devised a plan to save the race. They have decided to build 500,000 bunkers, and a lottery will be conducted to select the people who will be staying in them. Each bunker will have only one inhabitant, and they will have to live there until the flu subsides. Once everything is back to normal, the people will be gathered again for a repopulation program. We are then shown the interior of the fallout bunker, which has enough supplies stored in it to last an astonishing 70 years. The bathroom has access to a 24-hour water supply, which is recycled and used again. For electricity, the inhabitants of the bunker are made to do regular exercise. When it comes to food, they are simply fed with a protein shake called Suplaval, which emerges from a tap. The bunker also has accurate weather representations. When it's morning, a sunny environment will be shown, and when it's night, the room becomes completely dark. This helps the inhabitants control their sleep patterns. Cut to several years later, we are shown a group of seven people chatting through a video conference. Although all of them are living in their separate bunkers, they do everything with the consent of one another. The seven people are named after their respective cities, and Boston, a strict but soft-hearted guy, is their leader. In one of these conferences, an aggressive man from the group named Orlando berates all of his friends. He also mentions that the outside world will never revert back to normal. Hence, they are trapped here their entire life. Boston and the others try to calm him down, but Orlando does not listen. Instead, he reveals his gruesome past, where he killed 15 people and got a life sentence. One of the group members, Atlanta, who is an extremely religious woman, gets angry and confronts Orlando about the murders. The deranged killer simply replies that it gave him pleasure. Hearing this, the group gets disgusted, as they wish to get rid of Orlando once and for all. Luckily, there is an IT expert in the group, who goes by the name Denver. He mentions that he has learnt how to hack basic things, and can possibly turn off Orlando's transmission. However, there is a catch. If he turns off the transmission once, it will be impossible to get it back again. This means that if Orlando's video calling ability is turned off, he may have to live the rest of his life alone, without anyone to talk to. And you can be sure that's going to make him want to kill more people people later. The decision is a very tough one, so the group decides to take it to a vote. Three people, Boston, Atlanta, and a man named Chicago, vote for Orlando's transmission to be cut off. However, a woman named Phoenix and another man, Houston, claim that the punishment is simply too severe, and hence, vote against it. This leaves the decision up to the hacker, Denver's vote. But before he can speak, Orlando himself orders the group to cut off the transmission, claiming that he is sick of seeing their boring faces. Obliging to his request, Denver hacks the system and makes Orlando disappear forever. That night, a sleepless Phoenix wakes up and talks to Denver. They discuss the earlier incident, and Phoenix mentions that what they did was wrong. However, Denver consoles her by saying that it was the best thing to do. Here, it is revealed that the two are in a relationship. Following this, the movie fast forwards to eight months in the future. Despite losing one member, the group has adjusted well to the situation. However, due to an anomaly in the system, Houston's weather lights start changing abruptly. Because of this, he hasn't been able to sleep for some days. After a while, the group starts their usual meeting, and everyone reports their findings. It turns out that all the members are assigned with a particular task, like Atlanta has to keep track of her group's health, while Denver is responsible for notifying everyone about the outside world's status. This is possible due to the additional computers in the bunker, which shows various statistics, like the amount of people remaining in the world, the heartbeats of all the group members, and so on. While everyone is busy with their tasks, Chicago, who is the least productive member of the group, gets bored. He tells everyone that everything is futile, as they are never going to see the outside world again. Boston tries to scold him, but Chicago presses a button on the computer, forcing the bunker's manual to pop up on everyone's screen. Since the video cannot be skipped, everyone is forced to watch it. This would be a great time for some Rick Astley. In the video, the bunker's creator, Nadine, starts explaining the various amenities inside the bunker, and reveals that it is 30 feet below the surface. After this, she mentions that all 500,000 people 
people are divided into groups, and one such group consists of seven people. Their only job is to help each other survive until the virus is eradicated from the Earth. The video ends as Nadine narrates that there is still hope left on this Earth for humanity. Some days later, as the group is discussing in one of their regular conferences, their data computers suddenly shut down, though Boston thinks it's just a temporary defect. The others fear that their bunker is starting to disintegrate. The strange thing is that the computers are down in all six of their bunkers, despite them being thousands of miles away from each other. Later, Phoenix privately calls her boyfriend, Denver, and tells him that the system might have been compromised because of a loophole. The loophole started when they hacked into the system and shut down Orlando's video transmission. Phoenix then pleads with Denver to hack into the system again and bring back Orlando, as it might be the only way to restore their data computers back. However, Denver mentions that bringing back the transmission is not possible, so it's not worth trying. Hearing this, Phoenix becomes angry and starts narrating her life story. She reveals that her father died at a young age and she was brought up by her mother. But while growing up, she started doing drugs and even ran away from home several times. One day, when Phoenix didn't find her stash in her room, she suspected that her mother took it. Hence, in a fit of rage, she grabbed a pair of scissors and stabbed her mother to death. She was then incarcerated in a maximum security prison until the virus broke out and she won the lottery to the bunker. After hearing the story, Denver becomes emotional and promises to get Orlando transmission back. One night, he finally succeeds and calls Phoenix to share the good news. Surprisingly, when they watch Orlando's feed, he is nowhere to be found. In the next scene, the couple shows the feed to the rest of the group, and as expected, Boston is not happy that they took the decision without informing anyone. He is especially angry at Denver for hacking the system once again. However, the couple simply reply that they don't care about voting anymore. At night, Phoenix once again calls Denver and asks him if he can retrieve some of Orlando's personal videos that he had recorded. She mentions that the videos might reveal a clue as to where he went. Denver obliges and immediately gets to work. He puts those supreme hacking skills to the test and eventually manages to download several of Orlando's personal videos. Then, the couple starts watching the videos one by one. Most of them are just Orlando working out without his shirt on. Phew, goddamn. But in the last clip, the video is suddenly cut and only Orlando's screams can be heard. When the video comes back on, he has already vanished. It appears as if someone or something took him away and not even all that working out could save him. The next morning, the entire group discusses the strange video and everyone's opinions are divided. Boston believes that they are safe in the bunker and that they are simply overthinking, but Phoenix asserts that they have to find a way to escape before it's too late. On the other hand, Houston has started to go crazy because of his damaged weather lights. He has not slept in over a week, and as a result, he too supports Phoenix's plan of escaping. However, Boston orders everyone to stand down until they have conclusive proof. Unfortunately, things take a turn for the worse that night, as a now deranged Houston starts banging his head on the wall. Everyone pleads with him to stop, but at this point, he has lost his sanity. Just then, Houston's video transmission gets interrupted, and audio of someone barging inside his bunker is heard. When the video is back on, Houston is already gone, just like Orlando. This shocks the group, and now, they finally believe that something is up. The following morning, Phoenix takes charge of the group and instructs everyone to find something in their bunker from which they can escape. Apart from the lazy Chicago, everyone agrees, and they start inspecting their places. The religious woman, Atlanta, is the first one to find a lead. She breaks open a pipe, through which the supplevol protein is regulated in her bunker. As the entire group watches closely, Atlanta peeks through the pipe and notices that there is a vacuum space on the other side. This confuses everyone, as the bunker is supposed to be 30 feet buried beneath the surface. But before they can ask anything, Atlanta's transmission is cut and someone forcefully takes her away. Witnessing this, the remaining group is devastated, as they realize that anyone can be apprehended at any time. In particular, Chicago has lost hope for life. He slowly proceeds near the main door and commits the unthinkable, leaving everyone devastated. Now, only three people are remaining in the group. Although Boston and Phoenix have accepted their fates, Denver is not ready to give up so easily. He starts hacking into the system with all his expertise and finally achieves a breakthrough. He summons his distraught friends via a conference call and reveals that he has managed to hack into other survivors' bunkers. Phoenix and Boston don't believe him, but when Denver shows them the live transmission of some other survivors, they are taken aback. Denver then reveals a strange thing. Although he hacked into the entire system, he was only able to find 1,000 bunkers instead of the mentioned 500,000. 
Hearing this, Phoenix realizes that something is wrong. She then proposes to Denver and Boston that they attempt to escape one last time. Boston asserts that there is virtually no way of escaping the bunker, but Phoenix responds that there might be one. She mentions that if they cut the wires inside the bunker, the door might open. The boys think the plan is risky, but Phoenix is now willing to put her life on the line. Hence, seeing her determination, the boys agree to the plan. But before they can begin, Denver promises to Phoenix that he will travel across the country on foot. If that is the only way to get to her. Following this, all three of them begin cutting the wires. As soon as they succeed, an alarm starts ringing, and the door finally opens. The first one to venture out is Phoenix. Surprisingly, the door leads to a normal-looking apartment with a large hallway in it. Phoenix had always imagined that she was inside a bunker, but the truth was far from it. And before she can decipher anything, Denver comes out of the next door, implying that they were living in the same building for the past six years. As the two embrace one another, another in joy and confusion. Boston also emerges from another door. In the next scene, the three begin investigating the strange apartment until they reach the terrace. After six long years, they have finally experienced the sunlight. Meanwhile, Phoenix climbs a staircase to get a better overview of the city. Surprisingly, everything seems to be running as usual. People are walking on the streets, and the traffic is crowded. A while later, Phoenix approaches her friends to share the news, but they appear to be hiding from someone. It turns out that two people who look look like policemen, are searching for the trio. As there is no way to escape from the terrace, Boston decides to create a diversion so that his friends can flee. The plan works, and the couple climb downstairs until they reach an office. Suddenly, the creator of the bunker, Nadine, arrives with a gun and threatens Denver to stand back. She also warns Phoenix to stay away from him, claiming that he is a dangerous person. Confused, Phoenix inquires about what's happening, and Nadine finally reveals everything. It turns out that the bunkers are specialized prisons, and all the people inside of them are prisoners. Criminals like Phoenix never got out of prison. They were simply transferred to the bunkers, as Nadine wanted to give them hope and a new purpose in life. Moreover, the Saharan flu never existed, and the news reports on TV were simply fabricated for the prisoners. Denver's speculation also comes true, when Nadine mentions that only 1,000 prisoners are jailed in the bunkers. Then, Phoenix asks why the prisoners are being forced out of their bunkers, indicated by the several recent appearances. Nadine explains that when Orlando was kicked out of the group, his video was somehow leaked to the public, and it caused a public outrage. They believed that such prisoners were given too much freedom and luxury in the bunker, and as a result, the government is ordered to shut down the project. Hence, they're pulling everyone out to make some changes in the bunkers, and putting them back in until they can find a space in the prison system for them. For the time being, their bunkers will be modified in such a way that the prisoners will have less freedom, and their lives will become more uncomfortable. Expectedly, the revelation shocks the couple, but Phoenix is still curious about one thing. She asks Nadine why Denver was incarcerated, and the latter reveals that he stalked 15 women online and murdered them brutally. Hearing this, Phoenix is devastated, as she realizes that Denver was just pretending to love her all this time. But Denver didn't think he was ever getting out, so that twist is dumb. Soon, the police officers from before arrive in the room and knock the two out. In the last scene, Phoenix and Denver are taken to the same hallway, where they come across the entire group except for Chicago. Orlando is also there, but when he tries to escape, he is shot and killed. The movie ends as the remaining five survivors are sent back to their respective bunkers, which have now been transformed into a grim, terrorizing room. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.